the name of Christ who calls us. Amen. So I am very tempted to tell you a few amusing stories about this woman tearing the house apart looking for her hearing aids. But uh, I won't go there. We started out today with a very stern reading from Jeremiah in which it seems that God is just simply abandoning folks to the consequences of their behavior. It seems that the nation has forgotten their purpose and gone astray and God is simply saying, no, I'm not going to do about this one. The land will go into mourning. Everything's going to fall apart. That's how it is. And, and that's pretty uh, disturbing to read. Then we have Jesus who this morning is talking about how God is so persistent and comes after us and searches for us and rejoices when we are found and transformed. And it feels a little bit like a contradiction. The story of the Hebrew scriptures are in main the story of how God creates and chooses a people for God's own name, to bring about God's purposes of transformation on the earth. And how that people over and over again miss the point, blow it. And in the end, there's this feeling like the whole experiment is a failure. And that there is some hope, but God knows where that hope lies. Jesus, on the other hand, comes teaching and preaching about this kingdom of God. But when you ask him what the kingdom of God is like, he's not talking about a place in which some human being is king, and there are standing armies and taxes and laws and boundaries. He says crazy things, like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a guy who threw a party. The kingdom of God is like a woman who lost a coin. The kingdom of God seems to function on a whole different set of rules than governments normally function upon. They had to do with a kind of amazing humility on God's part and a kind of tender determination of God to be at work in mysterious ways. And I don't mean that so cliche, as cliche as it sounds. But to be at work in interior ways in transforming human beings from within. So, at face value, if the Hebrew scripture stories that are held up in the prophets are about a failure of a national attempt to convey God's purposes, does that mean that this kingdom of God that Jesus described, that it is so hidden and interior in its nature, does that mean that religion is supposed to be personal? And private, just between me and Jesus, has God abandoned the public sphere, the political sphere, the larger world in which we make policies and decisions about our lives together? Much of Christianity has interpreted Jesus' teaching that way and said that, oh, the only salvation is through individual pietism. You, you, you just say your prayers and do your individual acts of kindness and service and never you mind about the rest because the rest is going to the dogs. That's one answer. That's one way that people have taken the language of Jesus. I was talking with my sister-in-law uh, this weekend and she said to me, you know, we were talking about my involvement in this whole poll issue. And, and she was um, encouraging me, but then she turned to me and she swaggered her right over and she said, Now, 
Now, don't you start preaching that from the pulpit. Oh. <laughs> she said, I left my church because they were telling me how to vote. And I resent that. And that doesn't belong in the pulpit. What belongs in the pulpit are gospel principles. Preach the gospel. That's it. Okay. But I wrestle with that because what good is the gospel if it's so divorced from human experiences that there's no way to apply it to our lives? If it's just about some kind of emotional experience or simple personal pietism, that troubles me because what I keep hearing Jesus doing is proclaiming good news to the poor and, and working for transformation and, and acknowledging when he tells this story about the sheep or about the poor, he's trying to say that there are no outcasts in God's kingdom. That every person is of dignity and value in God's kingdom. That's immensely good news for all of us. Well, at least for those of us who might have considered ourselves outsiders in some way or time. But if that is the case, and we are transformed by that good news from within, is there not an application of that? Should we not be working for dignity and peace and freedom for all people? And does that not have political application? Mm -hmm. What are we to do with that? What are we to do with that? What does Jesus have in mind? And while it's pretty easy for me to agree with my sister-in-law and say, yeah, we've got to stick to the gospel, Somehow we've got to connect the dots, don't we? We have to connect the dots between those larger principles of loving God and neighbor and the dignity of every human being and what that actually means in the day-to-day -day living of our lives. <coughs> and the closer we get to specific applications of love, the more likely we are to conflict on what that looks like the more likely we are to find applications that seem, values that seem to be in conflict sometimes, or understandings that are in conflict sometimes. And that causes those of us who are conflict avoidant, like myself, to be tempted to abdicate the whole thing. But you know what happens when you abdicate, when people of goodwill and good intentions and deep values abdicate the conversation, the conversation becomes dominated by the bullies. The conversation becomes dominated by those who are self-interested. Is that what Christ is calling us to? Give up on the world? I don't see that in Jesus. I don't see it in Jesus as he goes to the cross. If he was about giving up on the world, he would have hit out. He wouldn't have confronted the powers that be and gotten himself crucified. So here's the trick. To hold in tension those that call to love every single person and value every single person and continue to move forward as best as we are able with our understanding. I love the image now, if you apply that image to us, of the woman searching the house for her coin. She probably looked in some of the wrong places first, but she was determined to find that kernel of truth, that golden thing, and so she kept at it, and so she engaged. I believe that we are called to the difficult work of continuing to search and continuing to engage, and with some humility, fighting for what we believe. Once we have formed some kind of opinion, and we to do that with tenderness, to do that with respect for one another, but to learn to listen and learn to differ and keep at it. 
And I've come to the conclusion that the kingdom of God does not reside in any particular application or any particular idea. I know for sure the kingdom of God does not reside in any nation or any political party or even any denomination or any particular religious practice. The kingdom of God is that mysterious, crazy thing that gets sown in our hearts and is manifested when we choose to love as best as we are able. And we may make mistakes. But we are still living in God's kingdom when we choose to love and practice that love in real and practical ways. I have a hunch that Tuesday night the kingdom of God will be at work in the union worker who is advocating for jobs and in the doctor that is advocating for the health of the community. And you all know what I think. And you're all free to disagree. But what we, none of us are free to do as Christians is to walk away and discard this planet we live on and our neighbors and refuse to care and refuse to engage and refuse to seek for that truth. For surely as Jesus cares about every single lost and searching one of us, We must also care for one another. And we are given the gift of a democratic society in which to do that. And the kingdom of God is not, will be manifest when we take those risks. And when we get out there and mix it up with each other with love and respect. Amen.